God, right now we uh, lift up this teaching time to you. Uh, we pray that you will speak through Earl. Uh, we pray that you will open up our hearts and our ears uh, to hear what you have to say to us. Uh, we love you. We're yours. And it's your son's name we pray. Amen. The major needs no introduction. When Richie asked if I would be willing to speak this week, he said, give him a scorcher like it's from the gates of hell. And I'm going, no, you didn't say that. Oh, good. I didn't know whether to be offended or not, like I was the inspector of hell or something. I didn't know it just it got lost. But I want to speak to uh, us this morning as Christ followers, and I want us to focus on our actions and our thoughts. And let's spend a little time just seeing if we really are being Christ-like. I want to use a visual this morning that has spoken to me. This visual struck me a few weeks ago when I was uh, in a particular Bible study, and it's like you probably, you come to a passage of Scripture you've read many times, and then suddenly, sudden something just leaps off the page at you and you're seeing something that you never saw before. And so it was uh, as I was being directed to look at the story of Lazarus. You remember the story of Lazarus in the New Testament? It's found in the Gospel of John. Lazarus, Lazarus and his two sisters are very close friends of Christ. They have spent a lot of time together. Jesus and his disciples are away from the town in which Lazarus and his two sisters live, and uh, Lazarus has died, and Jesus becomes aware of it, and instead of rushing to Lazarus' side, Jesus tarries for a little while. And you know the story that uh, Jesus finally makes his way to the town where Lazarus lives. He has an interaction with the two sisters, and uh, then he is at, he asks to be taken to the tomb where Lazarus is buried. And I want to read for you, if you have your Bibles, this is not going to appear on the screen, but then I want to read for you from John chapter 11, verses 17 and following, and then I'll point out the part of this fairly long passage of Scripture that I kind of saw uh, differently. It kind of just leapt off the page for me. And this is verse 17. On his arrival... Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever, live, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, and she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house accompanying her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who had opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, Jesus said. The Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. 
Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now there's a lot to be learned from this miracle. There's a lot that we can learn just from the faith of Lazarus and his family, his sisters. There's a lot that we can learn as we focused in on what it's like to have a friend like Jesus. There's a, there's a lot to be learned just about the whole biblical re revelation of death and the questions that you and I have about death and why people die and when they die, particularly a, a seemingly untimely death like Lazarus' death was. But this morning I want to focus on how Lazarus came out of the grave and the instructions of Jesus when Lazarus appeared at the door of the tomb. Lazarus had been dead probably for five days. The custom back then was to bury a person who had died within one day. We're told by this account that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four. So one day before they put him in the tomb and then four days, he'd been dead for five days. Jesus calls his name. Probably the sweetest sound that Lazarus ever heard. Lazarus, come out. And Jesus brings him back to life, and Lazarus hobbles out of the tomb. Why did I say hobble? Because he was bound from head to foot with strips of cloth. They would take strips of linen, and they would bind the dead person, um, and they would do it from head to toe, and there would be special claws uh, cloth rather over one's face it almost made this dead person look like a mummy in fact it had the effect of making them into a mummy sometimes if you were wealthy enough they would put special fragrances and spices things that were aromatic into it too. all of this was to try to slow down the process of rot and decay purification they wanted to try to hold the body together as long as they could. But the dead person didn't care. The dead person was dead. The dead person didn't care what scents and aromas you might put in there, how you would wrap things up. For with the dead person, Lazarus was dead. Lazarus could not see. He could not hear. He could not talk. He could not walk. He was dead. When Lazarus appears, having been brought back to life, his dead body, his dead cells, finding new life by the power of Christ Jesus, he comes to the grave entrance, to the tomb of the, to the door of the tomb. And the first thing that Jesus says, directed to Lazarus, once he appears, is take off the strips of cloth. Take away everything that speaks of death. Now, Lazarus having been dead for five days and in the tomb for four days, my suspicion is, and the suspicion of those that were there, is that he'd already begun to suffer decay. And that decay had gotten on to the strips of cloth. They now had rot on them. It's an ugly thought. Isn't it? And so Jesus said, get that off of there. He's alive. We don't want anything on him. We don't, we don't want the smell of death on him. I think that the only thing that Jesus restored was Lazarus' body. I don't think he restored the integrity of the cloth. They were just dirty old rags. 
what would it have been like if Lazarus had appeared, come back to life, he was at the door of the tomb, and nobody took off the cloth, these strips of cloth. He would have hobbled the rest of his life. He, he, he would have looked so strange as he walked through the marketplace. More than that, my, my fear for him is that because there was rot on the cloth, Given time, that rock would have attacked his healthy, his new resurrected body. He would have begun the slow process of decay all over again. There might have been infection, other things that would have attacked the health. Now let's switch gears for just a moment. I want us to think about our spiritual life. In Christ, because we are given new life. Jesus has said to us, as we have accepted his invitation, he's called our names. And in some ways, similar to that of Lazarus, we have come out of the grave. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says as he describes what we have gone through as we have become Christ followers. He says, We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. We had an old dead life. We were just like Lazarus. We were in that tomb. And Christ has called us out. And through our baptism, that symbolism of baptism, we have gone from dead to life. Going further, Paul would say, if we'd be had been united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in the resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. When we are born again, we are called into life and we've been called to take off the old dead things. And so I have this image of Lazarus being unwrapped and all that those, the cloth that he had been wrapped in, all that, that symbolized death is being taken off of him. But I wonder if we sometimes say to Christ, no, I'd like to leave a part of that old dead stuff on me. What if a man said, I'd like to have the cloth that was wound around my head. I'd like to keep it on there because, you know, I kind of like the thinking that I had when I was dead. I kind of like the thinking that I had when I was in the tomb. So just leave that cloth on. Oh, you can take some of the rest of it off, but let's, I, I'm going to stick with my thinking that I had in the tomb. Could it be that we suffer because we've not removed or allowed Christ to remove from our thinking the things which speak more of death than they do of the life to which we are called in Christ? The Apostle Paul says this about our thinking. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The Apostle Paul writing to the church of Rome said, for those who are in accord with the flesh, and the flesh here, as the Apostle Paul uses that word, is really talking about the old life, that life that is of death, that life that is in the tomb, the life to which we are called out of into a new life. He says, for those who are in accord with that flesh, that death, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in accord with the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life, and peace because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God. 
fact, the Apostle Paul would go on to say in 1 Corinthians, he says, we have the mind of Christ. God has given us the ability to, to take all the wrappings of the old dead ways out, off of our minds. And thus for the Christian who has set aside the things of death in our minds, our thinking should be dynamically different from those who are still in the tomb. How is the thinking of the tomb evidence? What, what do we look for if we're thinking about someone who has yet to take off the cloth, that death cloth from their thinking, from their mind? You ever met somebody that's constantly negative? You ever met somebody that's more concerned by what the influential people of this world say than what the Bible says? Ever met someone who's always thinking about ugly things? Someone who doesn't believe that God can really change people? Doesn't believe in miracles? Never satisfied with the true creation to which God has called us and prepared for us as new creatures in Christ. Have you ever met somebody that's more concerned about American rights than they are heaven's opportunities and privileges? Uh, somebody that will fight for the right to carry a gun but not fight for the salvation of a neighbor. Believe you me, I, I, I believe in the Second Amendment. I'm all for it, but I believe more in heaven. You ever met somebody that has difficulty of stepping into the shoes of others or seeing how others see the world? Never kingdom-minded. Life of excuses. It's always someone else's fault. Still got the death cloth on their mind. How about a, somebody that says, you know, I kind of liked what I saw in the tomb, which was nothing. So th don't take the cloth off my eyes. Paul would say, right at the church at Ephesus, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Apostle John would write it this way. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. See, there is a way that, that our eyes adjust to death. And we see things through death. We see things like the world sees things. And we're called to, to come away from that kind of eyesight and into the eyesight that God gives us. When we follow Jesus, we see the world differently. And it's not the way the world sees it. Here's how the sight of those who want to follow Jesus but still haven't taken the, the death cloth off their eyes, here's how it sometimes evidences itself. For men, Sometimes it's pornography. For women, it's being envious of another woman. Wanting to be somebody other than that creation in Christ to which you are called. It's watching the filth of TV, movies, and real life celebrities and not being ashamed how they live and what they stand for. Not being embarrassed. What about a person that says, you know, I kind of like the way they talk in the grave. I kind of like the way they talk in the tomb. So let's just leave the, that death cloth on, our, on my mouth. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, but sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not be mentioned among you as is proper among the saints. There must be no filthiness or foolish talk or vulgar joking which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. 
How is the language of the grave evidenced? Filthy language. But more than that, Christians are called to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. Christians are called to be the sharers of eternal wisdom, not what's popular, not what's on tic tac, top talk, whatever it is in the world today. We got to share foolish, earthly advice. We're to be people who know when to open our mouths and know when to shut our mouths. And when we open them, we have good and godly things to say. How about a person that says, you know, I kind of like what I heard in the tomb. Right, so let's just leave the, the death rag on my ears. Paul would say, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. <clears throat> the world really doesn't care what it hears. It just jibber jabbers foolishness. Sometimes it seems to me, I'm, I'm just getting old. I'm just getting old. I, I'm going to admit to you, I'm getting old. And it just seems to me sometimes the filthier the language, the more people like it. I, I don't get it. I, I just don't get it. But there ought to be a difference when compared to the life of the Christ follower who's had the, the things of death taken away from their ears. Here's how the sounds of the grave evidence themselves. We're moved. We're still in the camp of the tomb. We're moved more by the world of influencers. I just said something. I don't even know what that is. The world of influencers than the words of Jesus. Moved more by secular television newscasters than the inspired words of the Apostle Paul. Moved more by the words of politicians than those of the Apostle John. We quote those people. We quote the influencers, the newscasters, the, newscasters, the, the politicians rather than the words of the scriptures. We read more of them than we do of the scriptures. What about a person that says, I want you to keep that binding of death on my heart. I, I kind of like the way I felt in the tomb. It speaks to how we love. Listen to what Jesus says. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may prove yourself to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good also sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do not do not they do the same? Therefore you shall be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You'll recall this passage of scripture, the apostle Paul, it's called the, the love chapter from 1 Corinthians 13 says, now abides faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. That's not a call for us to abandon faith or hope, but it is to put love above them. You see, the world hates, but Christians love even their enemies. So how is the hatred of the grave evidencing itself? So I ask you, who are your enemies? And what have you and I done to show that we love them in the name of Jesus as we follow Christ? You see, I've, I've run across people who cannot forgive. 
They hold a grudge all of their lives. In church, matters of faith, they elevate theology above love. They have a hard time accepting people who are different from different cultures. They can't associate